Good afternoon, and uh, today we're uh, pleased to have Dr. Richard Hamming, one of uh, our own professors, to talk to us today. Uh, Dr. Hamming uh, is noted for his work at Bell Labs in the area of information coding and filters, and many of you in uh, electrical engineering and computer science probably already know all about that. Uh, he worked at Bell Labs for approximately 30 years, and uh, because of his work, ended up having a medal at, from the Institute of Electrical Electronic Engineers named for him, and was the recipient of several awards for his work in those fields. Uh, today is a, in the week of uh, national science and technology, and I thought it was most appropriate that we have Dr. Hamming discuss the future of science and engineering. It is an honor to be here and to be asked to give this talk. It is pretty much the same talk as I gave at Annapolis the Naval Academy last week. When asked to give the talk there, I asked myself, what is it the audience is interested in? It's easy to give a talk what the speaker cares about. It's more important that you give a talk that the, they care about. Well, I said, the thing they care about is their future. Their future is connected with the Navy. The future of the Navy is very tightly bound up with the future of engineering and science. That is something I think I know a little bit about. That is what I'll talk about. Now, I'm going to leave some time, I hope, at the end for you to ask questions because it's a very controversial, open-ended talk. So save up your questions and we'll try and answer them at the end. It is said that there are more than 100 ways of predicting the future. If there are 100 ways, then there aren't any of them. Actually, are about three useful methods. History, local trends, and imagination. Taking history first, there is a saying, history repeats itself, but of course it doesn't. The situation is never twice the same. On the other hand, it is the same human people who are creating history. We are all human beings pretty much the same. So there is a tendency for the same things to happen. And indeed, Santayana said, those who cannot repeat, remember the past are condemned to repeat it. So history will be a useful tool. The second tool, trends, is a little dangerous because you measure two local measurements and any small amount of difference in the errors will greatly change the rate of which things are going on. So while you like to use local trends, they are not very safe. Furthermore, they may be peculiar. The third tool I mentioned was imagination. And that is very hard to use because the first thing you do is predict what you want to happen. If you will follow through your prediction by examining how much is that is what I want and how much is really reality, you have a chance of coming up with a good prediction. But you must doubt your first several predictions and ask how much am I predicting what I want as against what I think. Now, how far in the future am I looking? I chose arbitrarily the year 2020. It has three good features. One, that is the time when many of you will be arriving at Admiral and assuming responsibility for the Navy. Secondly, it has the lovely expression, 2020 foresight. Of course, we all know we don't have 20-20 hindsight even, but still, it's worth, as I will try and point out to you, having a vision of where you are headed. And thirdly, it's a very convenient date because I won't be around to be found wrong. <laughs> all methods of predicting the future fail on one thing, the unexpected event. Thus, if you consider my career of computing starting at Los Alamos, designing atomic bombs, we use machines which calculate something less than one operation per second. We operated 24 hours a day around the clock, and a problem might take us up to three months. Now you could do a problem in three seconds. It would be impossible to foresee that change, the invention of the transistor, among other things. 
Yes, we saw tubes were getting smaller, we saw various things, but the transistor was a little bit strange. But far more was the integrated circuit. Before the integrated circuit, the problem of interconnecting parts, the solder joint, was a very large problem of all computers. Now, while still an annoying point, it is now not dominant. The integrated chip gives you all the connections made by a different method. So those two things, the invention of the transistor and the integrated chip, has changed the whole nature of computing. And I say it's not easily foreseen. Although we were shrinking tubes, we know that Aitken was trying to incorporate more solid state devices in computers. There were clues, but the idea that we'd be able to move as far as we had seems to me impossible to imagine, even by hindsight. Now, if predicting the future is hard, we do have a couple of simple rules. It is well known that in the short haul, your predictions are optimistic, in the long haul, you are pessimistic. And the reasons are quite simple. To do research in an area, you have to be optimistic. And in short haul, your optimism dominates, and you think you're going to get a lot of work done, and of course, you don't, as you'll find out when you write your thesis. You don't get that much done. <laughs> On the other hand, because knowledge is cumulative in a geometric regression, the more you know, the more you have, and so on, it grows geometrically, it is difficult to really understand how much progress will happen in the long run. Therefore, most long-range predictions are less than what happens. With those two rules, let's go on. It has been said that we are going through a phase change in science. Now, a phase change in physics means as I take some ice and heat it and I pump in water, I heat regularly, it melts slowly. But during the melting period, as I pour in more heat, the temperature does not go up. When I pass that, the heat the temperature goes up again until I come to boiling. And again, I have a phase change where I put in energy and I do not get corresponding rise in temperature. That's what we mean by phase change, and that is what is thought to going on now in science. The claim is made that we're doing this in science because we're changing the way we are doing science and engineering. It takes time to pass from the old way to the new way. Not long ago, when I was at Bell Labs, I made a prediction. Nine out of 10 experiments were done in the lab and one in 10 on the computer. And I said before I left, which was quite a few years ago, it'll be reversed. Nine out of 10 experiments were done on the computer and one in the lab. And I was more than right. We have changed enormously how we do science. Long ago, Euler wrote down the equations of fluid dynamics, and other people have added various parts for boundary conditions. But it's only recently we had the power of machines to actually solve those equations in useful forms. Now, with the age of computers, we get these solutions. For example, airplane design not too long ago was done mainly with a wind tunnel, and computers were used to fill in places here and there to interpolate and to check a little bit. Boeing and other designers have completely reversed. We now compute the design and we use a wind tunnel as a check here and there. The science is done completely different because although we knew the equations, the machine has enabled us to change the way we're doing it. The other day we offered a place a supersonic wind tunnel or a computer. They chose a computer rather than wind tunnel. This means we are going back to what you heard in medieval scholasticism, where they didn't look at reality, they figured out what it ought to be. And we are indeed moving in that direction. And some of us worry a fair amount, how far can we go on simulation with computers without the actual verification? How much must we look regularly at the real world, and how much can we calculate? Well, you know in classical mechanics, you don't do experiments, you calculate what's going to happen. And by and large, you model all right. In other fields, you do a little more experimenting, but it's a question of how far we'll go and how far dare we go. Well, we don't know how far we're going to go. And if we're passing through a phase, what it'll be like? Well, it's hard to say. I really cannot tell you the extent to which we'll be able to encode on computers our methods as against the, our techniques. Can we code general purpose mathematical theorems and really get them usefully in the machine to be used, or will we always limp and sort of have to direct it ourselves and have the machine invoke? Now, there's another difficulty about predicting, and that is, as our society gets more tightly integrated, the feedback is more rapid, change is more rapid, and therefore, you can see less far from the present position. 
Still, I'm stuck with trying to see 2020. Well, if it's so hard, and it is hard to predict, why bother? There's a simple reason, and I best explain it in terms of a drunken sailor story. The story goes, a drunken sailor, he says, this way, this way, this way, this way. And at the end of end steps, random walk will get you roughly end of the one half distance away. Of course, he might be at the origin. Of course, he might be far away. But the probable distance is end of the one half, where end is the number of steps. The second version is, over in that direction, there's a pretty girl. So he staggers this way, this way, this way, and he gets the distance proportional to n. Now, over a lifetime, you make many, many decisions. From the time you make the big choice to do this or that, down to how you dress on a given occasion, whether you study another hour or not, surely there are more than 10,000 choices in your lifetime that affect your career. Well, the square of 10,000 is 100 which isn't much. And if you have a random walk life where you have not a vision of where you want to be, that's the progress you can expect, around 100 out of 10,000 choices. If, on the other hand, you have a vision where you and the Navy are headed, you'll get something proportional to 10,000. The difference is enormous. And as far as I can make out in studying great scientists, that is one of the major differences between the average scientist and the great scientist. The great scientist has a vision of where he is, his field is headed, and the average person simply responds to local effects and gets nowhere. Well, somewhere, but not much. Now, I can give you an example of my own experience. At Bell Laboratories, I got computers going because I was the only person around who had much idea coming out of Los Alamos. I naturally had an idea. But I didn't want to manage, so I finally took a leave of absence, hoping to get out of managing, and a friend of mine took over. Well, he had no vision. He was a very nice person. And when I came back and watched him, I saw him promise something in the morning to somebody and promise something else in the afternoon, which negated the effect of the first one. He had no vision, and instead of marching forward to go, the computing center began to drift in a random walk. It's very easy to see, and you notice it all the time, and most people do not have a vision which they'll persist in follow. Now, it doesn't really matter what vision you have to a great extent. For example, Michelson, of Navy fame, having measured velocity of light and other things, when he was forming his ideas in the late 1800s, had the vision, as many other people did, that the future of physics lay in more accurate measurements. And that's what he spent his life doing. I don't want to belittle measuring as being trivial. After all, the most recent Nobel Prize was given to three guys because they made more accurate measurements. It's an important topic. But right over the horizon, was quantum mechanics, special relativity, general relativity, and the new quantum mechanics. None of which he foresaw, and to a great extent, none of which he really accepted. Nevertheless, because he had a vision, he did very great work. And I'm using that as one single example to say the vision, the particular one you have, is not so important as that you have a coherent vision which causes your life to be cumulative rather than self-canceling. Now, history is one of the major tools, so let's look at the situation in the late 1900s, late 1800s when Michelson was working. We knew that the black body radiation curve, we had a theory for the low frequency, which went off to infinity to high. We had a frequency, a high frequency, which went off to infinity to zero, both of which we knew fitted partly, but not very well. Max Planck took the data fitted a curve, found the curve fitted so well, he said, there must be some derivation of this equation. So he started deriving it and couldn't get it. He finally used the method they taught you in calculus. Drop back to the finite case, calculate it, and go to the limit. He starts, he's got it in the limit, it's gone. He finally concludes he's got to stop at a finite size, and what's he got? Planck's constant. He had a vision of what he was going to do, and he got it. It was very simple. It came out of some contradictions. Now, there are other errors. In the matter of radiation, we felt that the atoms, electrons going around the atom, ought to radiate and consequently lose energy and collapse into the atom center. But obviously, the atoms were stable, and the spectral lines were sharp. There were a bunch of other well-known ones, of which Michelson himself produced the failure to find any ether drift. Well, let's look now. What is our situation in the late 
1900s. First, let me talk about the collapse of the wave function in quantum mechanics. And to make it simple for you, cabinet, think of light wave coming in a telescope. You pictured a wave in physics coming in and hitting a telescope. Now that wave knows how big the telescope diameter is because at the final picture, the diffraction rings which you will see depend upon the diameter. And if you put a spider web for a mirror in the middle, this diffraction rings will show the lines there. So that somehow the incoming wave sees the whole the input of the telescope as a whole. On the other hand, you know that when it hits the photographic plate, it develops one grain. Or if it hits the detector, it detects roughly at one point. Somehow that knowledge of the whole is concentrated down to one point. And that's what we mean, in a sense, by the collapse of the wave function. We have the idea of the wave function is spread around every place, but finally, the particle hits at one point. The photon comes in and hits the point, but along the way, it acted as a wave. Now, people who teach quantum mechanics find that the wave-particle duality is a problem. And they explain to the student, and the student looks baffled, and they say, well, I can't explain it. You'll get used to it. Well, Alain Aspect in Paris has done the following experiment about things. First, got to mention to you that relativity says, typically, there's a maximum velocity which you can signal usefully, namely the velocity of light. Nothing can signal usefully faster than that, although there may or may not be tachyons, they can't be used for signaling. So uh, relativity says. Well, what our boy Alain did is he sent off one particle in that direction, one that one with opposite spins. When they are well apart, he at random sets the measuring device to measure the polarization of this one, measures it, and immediately he measures the other one. He finds a correlation. He finds an instantaneously. What is done there is transmitted to there. What are you going to say? It contradicts relativity. Quantum mechanics and relativity are flat contradiction there. Now, by doing a random experiment, there is no setup until the last moment as to how the polarizing instrument is going to make. So there's no way of slowly transmitting information back. It comes from a random source way over at some other part. Now, if you believe in a quantum mechanic version of Copenhagen, you believe the thing is at some state only when you measure. Between states, it's not any particular, between measurements, it's not any particular state. Recently, that's been verified in the following way. A bunch of molecules are put in a given state and left alone. If so, they'll gradually drift into a bunch of different states. Instead of that, the man, something thousands of times a second, makes measurements on the state. And because he's had very little time to drift, it's pushed back to the same state. And after a long time, they're all back in the original state. They have not been able to drift. So the idea that the quantum mechanics puts the thing in the state seems to be partially verified. Now, another item you may know about is you've read, I'm sure, about gravity waves. Every number of people are going to build gravity wave devices. They must have thought they could detect them. And we improved detectors by factors of thousands, and we haven't found them. Well, what happened to them? If they exist, are they too small? Or maybe our theories aren't quite right. So another example of failure is the top quark. We set out to find a top quark, which we believe is there. And we thought it had about so much energy. And we looked for it. It wasn't there. Uh, the Europeans had to give up. The Americans took over and pushed it up a bit. And it wasn't there. And now we're hoping that the super collider, if built, will give us enough energy to measure it. But it means the particle is heavier than we thought it was. The more energy we require, the heavier the particle must be. And already, some of us are doubting that you're going to find it, that maybe it isn't there, in spite of all our theories saying it ought to be. Another disturbing question is the probability that arises in quantum mechanics clearly is not the probability a professor of mathematics taught you. Their probability was a real number between 0 and 1. In quantum mechanics, it's clearly a slight disguise of a complex number. And being complex numbers, that probability allows for interference. And that's what you find. So it's really the kind of probability which fits our needs and contradicts our usual one. But it means that probability in quantum mechanics doesn't mean what it means in a math course. And indeed, the physicists are not clear what they mean. There are various schools of thought. Because the theory was going pretty well set. And Born said, hey, the square of the amplitude is the probability. It was grafted on the last minute. There are no postulates at the bottom. It sort of is put on at the back end. 
Now, some physicists believe it's probability of a single event. Other ones think it's a tendency over many cases. Now, you have the same two ideas of probability in your head. Well, since it's complex numbers, it's got more and it be behaves differently. In cosmology, there's a redshift, which is believed to be Doppler effect, but some reputable phys astronomers have produced evidence that there may be other reasons for reducing redshift. The redshift can't explain some things that are happening. But it contradicts so much theory, they're sort of brushed aside. Again, the Big Bang Theory, which you read about, suggests a great deal of homogeneity. But we're finding more and more detailed, large-scale structure in the universe, much more than we can presently account for. At the moment, some of the quasars far away are too far evolved to justify what we think they should be if we came from the Big Bang originally. And we also know that we can't detect about 90% of the mass that we think is there, and maybe as much as 99%. We have never seen, don't know where it is, but we believe it has to be there. So there are a large number of things which are troublesome. Thus, the situation now in physics is not so different from what it was 100 years ago. Naturally, you ask the question, will we have some new theories, or won't we? Well, when theory is contradicted by experiment, there are a number of things one can do. Often, one can adjust theory a bit. One can redefine a few words. One can reinterpret the meaning of the results. But sometimes, one has to abandon the theory. So whether we'll abandon and find more or whether we won't is not something I can tell you, but something you will have to think about. Because by 2020, there will either be some new theories saying things quite different as relativity quantum mechanics came in, or you won't have them. It's, there's big questions out there which are contradictions. We don't know what's going to happen. Now, added to this difficulty is the growth of science and engineering. Typically, the amount of knowledge in science and engineering doubles every 17 years. Since the time of Newton, that has happened. Now, at Bell Labs, I watched the years I was there. The number of scientists doubled every 17 years. Never mind that various presidents tried to cut down recruiting, this, that, and the other thing. It was pretty steady state doubling every 17 years the number of employees. And when I left, 17,500 people were trying to improve what two people built. Now, if you take these years from Principia, which is good dates of Newton's, when he published it in 1687 to now, you find that doubling every 17 years fits. Now, how we handle this doubling? We are not smarter than Newton. Our minds are not that much better. We have coped with it by specialization. We now specialize very highly. I attended a meeting of a group of people devoted to one topic, the testing of integrated circuits. It was clear these people were spending the major effort of their life on how can you test integrated circuits coming off the production line. That's how specialized we can get. Well, if this doubling were to go on 340 years, that's 20 doublings, that's a factor of a million. And we would have a million fields especially for everyone now, and you know that's not going to happen. In the time frame which I'm predicting, up to 2020, that's going to produce about three and a half times as much knowledge as we now have. Something like that, if we go on. It's not clear we're going to. We, are, by and large, refuse to face the fact that we're growing knowledge so rapidly we can't keep with it, keep up with it. And the idea that computers will help us, yes, to some extent, but when it comes to understanding things, I'm a little dubious so it can do much. Yes, it can gather data, it can process data, it can select files, but sooner or later I have to read the stuff and understand it. At least I think I do. Another aspect which is bothersome. Over much of my lifetime and earlier, the sciences got a very disproportionate share of the brightest people going into college. The dumb ones majored education. Now we are not getting that large a fraction. We are still getting good men now and then, and of course other fields are getting. It's something like religion in the Middle Ages. In the Middle Ages, the church got some of the best minds, and now it's not getting an undue share of best minds. There are good people in it, but not. Now, if you happen to believe that science is done by the great man or the great person, then we're not going to have our supply of great people. If, on the other hand, you think a team of second-rate people can do what one person can by mass rather than quality, then the situation is different. Whether it is a usual story, if you want a baby in one month, you put nine women on a job. 
Whether it's that or whether, in fact, you must have the great men is a question because we are not going to have our supply of really great men. But we see big science coming up with many, many second-rate people, and it's not actually clear how it will come out. I cannot answer the question. It will depend on how you think. Can we replace great individuals by a large number of second-rate people who somehow can be organized to do just as good a job? I don't know. Vannevar Bush popularized during the Second World War Science, the Endless Frontier. What is it? Is there an endless amount? Yes, there is an endless amount of detail. We've calculated pi to a billion places, and there's many more digits you want. But that isn't what you mean by information. When you mean that, you mean, are there an infinite number of fundamental principles to be found? Or are there only a finite number? Which is, if there's an infinite number, one tends to be a little discouraged. If there's a finite number, you ask, how close are we to the limit? Nobody knows. But you've got to commit yourself. Every time you act, in some sense, you answer the question, what knowledge is worth knowing? Given the infinite sea in front of you, what knowledge is worth knowing is a question you must answer by your actions. It's a terrible question. It's very, very hard to answer. But I say again, effectively, as you study one subject or not another, as you do this or that, you are answering the question, what knowledge do you think is worth knowing, given that there's effectively an infinite amount, even if it's only a finite amount. Now, there are sounds that you cannot hear, but animals can. Dogs can hear things you can't hear. Dogs can smell things you cannot smell. There are sights you cannot see because you got about one octave. These limitations are due to your sense organs, and you recognize them. When I suggest to you that there are limitations on the things you can think, why should we bother? After all, your mind is wired the way it is. Why should you decide that you can think any thought? Perhaps we are limited. Well, I'll give you a candidate. After 50 years of professors lecturing on quantum mechanics about the wave particle duality, as I said, they're forced to say, you'll get used to it. We have been unable to explain it, yet I would think almost every conscientious professor has made an effort to try to explain the wave particle duality so students can understand it. Maybe that's one of the thoughts. Our minds being wired as they are now means we can't understand it in the sense we'd like to. On the other hand, quantum mechanics also provides the following model. We may not know what we're doing, but we've got a mechanism which does it quite well. We don't necessarily have to understand in order to make progress. We can resort to formalism and get there with some success. So it's a very interesting question of how far we can go. Now, I suppose many of you have heard of Godel's theorem, various theorems, which say more or less loosely that if you've got a reasonable rich set of postulates, then there will always be theorems whose truth or falsity cannot be proved within the system. And if you were to enlarge the system with new postulates, there will be other results. Now, this is not really a theorem in mathematics. It's a theorem about symbols and our method of reasoning with symbols. It says there are limitations of what we can do with formal manipulation of symbols. We just cannot prove and disprove all things we want. There'll be some on which we can either prove nor disprove, but we feel it has to be one or the other. But it doesn't mean we can't go on. Like quantum mechanics, we can still go on. But we'll have to use other than formal, logical methods. Now, Godel's theorem also suggests the question, if I could define a theory, what I mean by a theory sharply, the abstract idea of a theory, it seems likely that we could prove with Godel's theorem that there will be data which no theory can explain. In other words, we have to face the fact that there's likely to be things which will remain unexplainable within a formal symbolic method of manipulation. Not that we can't do it other ways. Now, I've been talking about what is possible in the future. I want to turn now to what is likely to happen. And for that, I've got to look at the thing called bureaucracy. Now, bureaucracy has got a bad reputation, but it's essential. If everybody does their own thing their own way, you have a mob. The purpose of bureaucracy is to convert the mob to an army, to direct people to build, work cooperatively rather than destructively one against the other. That's the real fundamental purpose of bureaucracy, and in a sense, you have to have it. A friend of mine 
who's a very knowledgeable man on campus here, said to me one time, he felt that bureaucracy and civilization went hand in hand. You could not have civilization without a bureaucracy to keep it coordinated and working together. Now, its bad reputation comes from two things. One, the diffusion of responsibility. When something giddy comes out, you want to pin it down, nobody's responsible, that's what the rules are. But you see, we're all that way. Take the average professor. The students lean on a professor, and the professor finally says, well, so much for homework, so much for quizzes, so much for midterm, so much for final, that's why I'll calculate the grade. That's a bureaucratic answer. The real answer should be, I will look at you as an individual. I'll try to arrive at a fair grade for you, judge as an individual. I will not judge you by a formula. But you know the agony of that. The students don't like it, the faculty doesn't like it. So we all, in some sense, faced with a large amount of things we processed, we reach for a bureaucratic method. It does save a lot of trouble and agony, but it also has that defect that it does give strange answers at times, that you should be judged as an individual, not as a bunch of numbers. But what can you do when you've got to deal with a bunch of people? The second bad feature is bureaucracy tends to respond to a crisis. They come up with a new rule. There's no large-scale vision whatsoever from moment to moment. But every once in a while, bureaucracy pulls itself together. For example, I understand the Defense Department has realized the innumerable rules about procurement have made the system so bad that the whole has got to be restudied from scratch. Similarly, most presidents coming in to the presidential office in the United States recognize that something's got to be done to cut down the amount of paperwork. And they value and try to cut it down, but you know what progress they make. And we've had several rules that the income tax orders must be simpler, but you know what happens. It's pretty hard. So it's not true this uh, bureaucracy cannot respond occasionally to big things and reorganize, but it does tend to work from moment to moment and produce small, petty rules to meet local crises. Well, now I've talked about what could happen first, and now model it, modulated by bureaucracy, what is probably going to happen? You have to ask that question. All kinds of things are possible, but given a bureaucracy, what things can the Navy actually do? So you need to think that second question. Not only what is possible, but what is probably going to come out. There's a third question you should ask yourself. What should the Navy be? That is a different question. Because insofar as what you believe the Navy should be, and it falls within what is possible, you have the clue of where to operate to cause what you believe you want as against what will likely happen. And that's exactly how the effective people work. They find out where they put something in to change it to cause it to happen what they want rather than what they don't want. Now, that means that you have to get a vision of what you think the Navy should be in the year 2020. Now, these are quite different. Insofar as you respond to the question, you can become part of history. Otherwise, you'll be name on a long list of graduation, another name on a promotion list, and maybe a footnote in history. But you won't become part of history unless you reach in and have a vision and cause it to happen. I see that most great scientists have a vision of what their science should be, and they struggle that way. It's a problem. Now, you being part of history seems at first alien to most people. When I was young, it never occurred to be a part of history. It turns out I am. Of course, in a million years, my name will be gone. But then so, like it be Newton's. We can't say one name from every year for a million years. We just can't manage to put that much in history. But nevertheless, it's worthwhile doing it for a little. To have the feeling you have affected society and your society, which by and large is the US Navy, although you have obligations to the whole of the country, and you have some obligations to the whole of society. At the other end, you have obligations to your family and to yourself. You have a whole cascade of obligations, one of which is the future of the Navy, which your life is bound up with fairly closely. Now, I have indicated, I hope, that insofar as I can see it, those who make a difference and go into history are those who have a vision of the future. They walk the farthest. And I came and agreed to give this talk mainly to get that point across. 
I want you to think systematically about your future and your Navy's future, not what could happen, but what you believe should happen among the things that might. Now, I've often said to people, there are three kinds of people in the world. There are those who cause things to happen. There are those who stand around and watch. And the vast majority who don't even know anything is happening. I want you to be one of the first. If not the first, surely the second. Now, you would not be here if you did not have the ability to matter. You couldn't have gotten into school. The school is trying to give you the background so you will have the ability to make the difference. My problem is to get you to form a resolution that you have a vision of where you are headed and what you believe the U.S. Navy should be. I will not presume to tell you. That's up to you. And it doesn't matter, I'll say again, a great deal, whether your vision is this way or that way. The person with a vision goes a distance and the person without a vision waffles around and accomplishes very little. So I trust you see my problem and what the challenge is. How do I get you to have a vision and pursue it? Thank you, and I'll answer any questions you've got if I can. Yes, sir. No. Uh, it's still in the hands of the publisher, and it will never be a textbook, I think, at this campus. But I assume, ultimately, it'll be available. It's supposed to be out by the end of this year, so the publisher said. Yes, good sales pitch. It was not rigged. No? No more questions? Come on. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yes. I think what you will see is first an attempt to balance the budget and shrink down research and other things where it's easily cut. But I believe the Navy is wise enough to realize with limited resources, it pays more to have very educated officers and do first class research so that the little amount of money you have will go further than with a mass consumption poorly directed. So while there may be fiddling around for a while, I believe enough faith in our system so that we'll recognize these two things. The need for very, very capable officers, and the need for fundamental research so we will not produce inferior things, but use our limited resources to the best. That's an opinion of mine, and you won't be able to hang on me, I'll be dead. <laughs> yes, sir? Oh, you want to know about that? I'm afraid I didn't quite get the part. Oh. My most difficult scientific question was, what are machines going to mean to society? That was my most difficult one. I spent far away the most time on it. How are they going to affect society? Well, you've already seen such enormous effect, you can't believe what we said in the early days when we got one operation per second. Or even when we got faster machines, when the machines cost so much that only we could do number crunching. We couldn't do symbol manipulation. We couldn't afford it. Nobody could pay the bill. Now I have a computer at home, more powerful than all this equipment we had at one time at Los Alamos, and it sits idle 99% of the time. I had to foresee that the same thing. I had this argument with my management. They wanted me to use the machine full time. I pointed out to them the telephones on our desk weren't used full times. And to be a little cruder, I pointed out to them the toilet facilities were not used 100%. <laughs> Why did they have redundant stuff there? Why not redundant computers? They could not believe we'd have redundant computers. And now we all have computing capacity lying around easily. To foresee that was very hard. And to foresee the psychological consequences of how we're going to get people to listen to the business 
was the hardest task I had to do, I think. Okay. I think the only thing can be done is what I am doing now, that scientists go out and say to other people how exciting science can be. I'm willing to drop of a hat to go out to various organizations here, there, and yon, and give a talk, like, what is it to be a mathematician? What is a scientist's life? And such other things. To give a broad general talk to make it exciting so the parents see their children should learn and live an exciting life. I don't know any other way. Proposing bigger salaries and so on, I have very little faith. Take what happens in church. The minister can preach all he wants to about behaving well. When he sets the model, that is when the parishioners behave. The same way, the acts of scientists themselves will convince other people more than any other one thing. No amount of propaganda will compare with scientists themselves going out and saying what exciting lives they have and how important it is. Yeah? Yeah. When I was at Bell Labs, I did a lot of simulation, and people wanted me to simulate. And I said, fine, but what I require are some real good hard equations, some real experimental data so I can test the model out to see if that happens. Without that, I won't budge. They went off and did something else. They didn't bother me. We lack any reasonable amount of data to test our models. And our models have changed, and I sort of have to go along with the President of the United States who says, yeah, you're asking to spend a lot of money, and you really don't know what you're doing. On the other hand, the problem is very important. It's a tough decision. I don't think to say, I would act on most of those simulations. They could be almost anything. Most of the time, the simulations are built to get the result they want, as did the Club of Rome. Several other simulations were caught red-handed. There was no way the simulation could ever give them other than the answer they got. We need some honest simulated people to look more carefully at the problem, and it's going to take a very long while. And we have, essentially, no real data to check. We haven't got the data, so I can't really say. After all, I know, and you know, that uh, the Earth has passed through all kinds of seasons. What were forests became deserts, and what were deserts became forests, and we know from past history. Change is the nature of the situation. Now we see change. Is it man-made, or is it just the nature going on? We shouldn't panic every time we see a change. On the other hand, uh, we better be careful. I have a mixed feeling. <laughs>